Lifestyle. Today we're going to talk about family, living a missional lifestyle in the context of family. Because at Challenge, our goal isn't just to get like a cool group of people together to hang out on Wednesdays. We want you guys to grow in your faith while in college. And not only that, we want that growth to be sustainable. We want that to be something you keep doing after you're out of college. We want you to continue to grow and continue to um, <clears throat> do ministry in various contexts, wherever God puts you in the future. So, you know, if you're really plugged into challenge, you kind of get like almost like built-in spiritual growth opportunities, you know, because we have like a volunteer team and you can, you know, <clears throat> uh, help us do outreach and things like that. You can get mentoring with somebody and, and like memorize scripture and they'll keep you accountable for that and your Bible reading and, and serving at church and things like that. Um, you have lots of Christian friends and influence here, right? But once you've graduated, and even during summer and winter breaks, you don't necessarily have that built in, right? Um, it takes a lot more effort on your part to maintain growth, to live a missional lifestyle, to, to do ministry. And that's why we want to make sure you guys are plugged into church, for example, so that after challenge, you've got church, right? Because that's where you're going to spend the vast majority of your Christian life, is is at a local church, not in challenge during your <coughs> five years of college. Um, so we want to give you guys tools that aren't aren't challenge dependent, right? That that you can take with you into the rest of your life. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, we really want to help you guys live on mission. And when I say that, I just mean you know sharing the gospel and making disciples of Jesus Christ for the rest of your life. Um, so how are you going to live on mission out in the workforce? You know out when you, when you get married? How are you going to live on mission when you have a family? Well, I'm pretty passionate about having a good family because I think the family is one of God's primary tools that he uses for changing the culture. I think that, for example, uh, when the early church, when the church was in its infancy, you had the apostles going out and starting churches, but a lot of times what happened was it was just normal, everyday people living out their faith in the context wherever they were. You know, when, when J Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, people dispersed everywhere. I mean, by the year 64 AD, there was a Christian community in Rome. The apostles weren't doing that all by themselves. It was people living their everyday lives in a missional way. And so I think that that's something that we can do here. We can do it in San Diego. You can do it wherever you go. Um, and so... <clears throat> I, I want to talk about how to live on mission in a family setting. And you might be like, Matt, why are you talking about this? I know, I'm, I'm a freshman or a sophomore or whatever, and that's like years away. Well, for a few reasons. Um, statistically speaking, almost everybody in here is going to get married, right? That's just the reality of it. Um, and that's really important because the second most important decision you're ever going to make in your life is who you marry. That's the second most important decision you're ever going to make in your life, behind following Christ, right? So that's probably going to be the thing that is going to define the rest of your life. How important is the right spouse? Well, Proverbs 31 says, an excellent wife, who can find? She is worth far more precious than, she is worth far more precious than jewels. I think I might have that. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and, and he will have no lack of gain. And it may be years away, but who knows? It may be closer than you think. You don't know. God knows. But another thing is that marriage is the human relationship that most closely resembles God's relationship with his church. 
there's no closer relationship that you can have with another person. So it's really important to get that decision right. Ephesians 5 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Yeah, I'm kidding. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And so this is such a tight relationship. You, you become one flesh. You know, your relationship is supposed to represent the love between Christ and the church. Like, oh my gosh, that is so close together. So this is super important. And who you marry on the negative side of things can drag you away from following Christ. Um, I've seen countless times somebody who, who seems to be following Christ who was led away because they valued this relationship so much with this person that wasn't following God. Um, there was somebody who was in me and Lucy's wedding that, uh, that uh, was led astray because they, they married the wrong person. Um, the red flags were there, you know, in that relationship. Uh, the, the person that they were dating wasn't a Christian. They were, they were rude, and, and we could see it. Um, but our friend desperately wanted somebody to date, somebody to be with for the rest of, of their life. And so um, they, they didn't care about that, about continuing to walk with Christ. And they haven't walked with Christ since, um, as far as I know. But on the flip side, the right spouse is going to magnify your ministry. You're going to be greater than the sum of your parts. And so examples of that include, you know, David and Jessica Wooster come to mind when I think of that. Uh, from history, people like Martin Luther and Katharina von Bora uh, come to mind. She really was on board with his mission. Another couple that comes to mind is Adoniram and Ann Judson, uh, the famous missionaries from the early 1800s. And because Anne grew up her whole life wanting to be a missionary. And then Adoniram came along and she's like, I'm on board. No, like literally, I'm on board. Get on board. Get on board. You know? <laughs> that's how, how desperately she wanted to be a missionary. And, and that was their ministry. And that's what they were called to. So here's one way you can think about it. Picture yourself running towards God. You know, you're, you're running the race that Paul talks about. Um, and you see somebody cross your path, going a different direction. You're like, oh, they look, they look kind of cute. And then, you know, you could, you could reach out for them and try to grab their hand, but they're going the opposite way, you know, and you're like, well, I want to follow Christ. And they're like, well, I want to go this way. And so, two, one of two things are going to happen. Either they're going to pull you away, from, and you're not going to be following Christ, or you're going to be trying to drag them with you, and it's going to be like swimming upstream, or you're banging your head against the wall. It's not going to work. But on the other hand, if you're walking or running towards God, and you look over, and there's somebody running the same way, and they look pretty cute. <laughs> you can be like, hey, let's do this together. And you grab hands. <laughs> so, that, that's kind of the difference, okay? It's either going to pull you away from Christ, because that can be an idol. That relationship can be an idol and take the place of God. Or it's going to magnify Christ in your ministry. Um, so, you know, now that we have our spouse, how do we live missionally? Well, I want to talk about some big picture things, some more vision things rather than some specifics so, so that you guys can get the idea, the flavor for it all. The first thing is to literally make disciples. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what I mean by literally make disciples? Have babies. Have babies. Have babies. Yeah, you can literally make disciples. <laughs> um, so, yeah, children, children are a blessing, Okay. Um, our thinking in the church has at times been seriously compromised by the thinking of the culture that kids are, are baggage or you know you, you can only you should only have like one or two or something. Um, sometimes people think of them as just some, someone to be taken care of, you know like a burden or at the worst, a necessary evil. Um, but Psalm 127 4 says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Now a warrior wants all the arrows he can have. Now, I'm not telling you to go have a family of 29 kids. But I am saying that children are valuable. Children are, are wonderful. Um, and so not only can children be a blessing to their parents, but they can be a blessing to the culture that they are raised in, um, if they are raised well. Uh, Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the 
So it's incumbent upon parents to disciple their kids, right? That is the parent's job, disciple your kids. A lot of times, and I've seen this so much, is you know, they think that it is the church's job to disciple their kids, or it is, you know, it's the pastor's job, or some, it's just not their job. You know, they're not the spiritual expert, so they don't have to do it. But <clears throat> that is what the Bible tells us. It says for us to bring up our kids and in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's, that's the parent's job. And Psalm tw or Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so we can't, if we have kids and we raise them well, then that is going to really affect the culture. Um, and so, yeah, one of the strongest ways that we can affect the culture is to have kids raise them up like God wants us to. Um, and really, it's, it, it's pure math. Studies show that people who are religious tend to have more kids than people who are not religious. So if we as Christians are having kids and we are teaching them the Bible and they get saved and they grow up and they want to live missionally too because they've seen you do it, um, <clears throat> how is America going to look different a generation from now? That could be pretty powerful. Um, if everybody in, say, say like Mission Trails Church, where there's like maybe 300 people come on a Sunday, if all of them raised their children that way and discipled their children, that would change like the whole neighborhood that it's in within one generation, if not more, because they're going to go out and do other stuff. And so... Also, for a society to replace itself and to not decrease in population, you have to have at least two kids per couple. That makes sense. You know, a couple, you have to have two kids, replace yourself, right? Right now, America is at about 1.9 kids per couple. There are like nine-tenths of children running around. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just have two kids that you disciple and you replace yourself, you're still having a positive impact on the culture, right? That's pretty cool. Um, and according to Jeremiah 29, the Jews were to seek the good of the land in which they lived. And I think that applies to us too. We can seek the good of the land in which we live um, by making disciples. Now, you might say, Matt, you only have one kid. Put your money where your mouth is. And, well, I'm trying. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm like, I've been like applying Kevin's message for like eight years now. So, um, you know, We'll see what God wants to do with that. Uh, but anyway, uh, early on in Genesis, though, God gives mankind this com command to multiply and fill the earth. We're supposed to multiply and, and fill the earth and subdue it. And that's called the dominion mandate. Now, I'm not sure. I've never like asked people, but I would guess that most Christians don't really think that applies to us today. Because, I mean, there's like 7 billion people in the world. That's like a lot of people, right? But has it really been fulfilled? Is there, is there a reason scripturally that we should like stop having children? And I don't really think that there is. Um, now, there, there is like the, the issue of like overpopulation, you know, and you have to take that into account. But in my opinion, the issue isn't really overpopulation, it's population distribution. And whenever you hear about overpopulation, you think of these really dense cities in like India and China and stuff. But like, have you ever been to Kansas? <laughs> have you ever been to Arizona or Alaska? There's like a lot of space. It's just that people are all stuck together. And it's also a problem with food distribution. Like they don't have enough food in some places, but they have way too much in other places. And so, point being, I, I think the Dominion Mandate still applies, you know? Um, so that's just something that we need to, to keep in mind. So, <clears throat> another thing is to model biblical relationships. That's the next point, model biblical relationships. Now, most of the people you meet in life will have had a less than stellar family life. Um, you know, divorce is rampant in our culture. A lot of people <coughs> will come from abusive families or where they had neglectful parents or simply parents who just didn't live by Christian values, who, who didn't know God. Um, my wife, Lucy, had a great family life growing up. And um, her, her mom and dad stayed married. They showed each other love. They raised their kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, like Ephesians 6.4 says, um, and taught them the Bible from an early age. 
And she's told me multiple times, you know, Matt, the, the longer I've been around, the more people I meet, the more I realize how rare my family life was. That I had a, actually a really good family life. And that's true. Most of the people you come into contact with will have never seen a Christian couple living out their faith like the Bible tells them to. And so if you can be that influence in somebody's life, that is going to be incredibly powerful. Because, you know, I'm big into apologetics. I love apologetics and defending the faith and helping people know what they believe and why they believe it. But I think the strongest apologetic is a life that is well lived. A life that is, that is, is biblical and that actually takes the Bible seriously. That's what actually wins people over more than logic and, and strong uh, airtight arguments. So we want to model biblical relationships. First of all, we do that for our peers. We want to model biblical relationships for our peers. Um, you know, spend time with your coworkers and friends. Invite them over to your house and so that they can see you with your family and how you relate to your family. Um, let them see how you treat your spouse, you know, how you're on board with their mission and they're on board with yours, uh, how you're for them. And, and also let them see how, how you treat your kids. That could be a big step in somebody's life, an eye-opener. Um, by the way, men, how you treat your wife is how your kids are going to treat your wife. So keep that in mind. That's for free. Um, also, you know, men, model biblical headship in your marriage. And women, model biblical submission. And that is going to be tough because our culture has this very twisted view of what that looks like. So it's incumbent on us to know what that actually looks like and to live that out for people. So the next thing is to model biblical relationships for those that you're discipling. Model biblical relationships for those that you are discipling. Um, help them know what a biblical marriage and family looks like. Uh, th this is going to help them know what to look for in a spouse, you know, how to relate to their spouse. Um, and how to raise their kids. And also let them learn from your mistakes. You know, don't like cover up any, any mistakes that you've, you've made in your marriage or, or raising your kids. Um, because you'll be doing them a huge service because they won't have to make those same mistakes. You know? It's always better to learn from somebody else's mistakes so that you don't have to learn from your own. Right? And so what happens if we don't place high priority on family? The book of Judges, a lot of the things in Genesis, polygamy, and things like that. There's a lot of dysfunction in the Bible. Just, just like read the Bible with like this view of like, what's the per this person's family life like? And it's it's really jacked. Like a lot of things are really jacked up. Uh, Absalom comes to mind. He wanted to like kill his dad and take over the kingdom. You know these things happen. Um, <laughs> so, but the the point is that there are both good and and bad examples in scripture, like things that we should should follow and things that the Bible is basically saying, don't do this, you know. So we need to keep both of those things in mind. So what are some things that you can do right now to, to live missionally, um, thinking about family, thinking about the future? Well, the first is to take responsibility. Take responsibility. Um, having a spouse and family is a, a big responsibility. Um, when Nora was born, I was like, oh my gosh, a human being. I'm in charge of this human. What do I do now? You know, like that's a big responsibility. But if you start taking responsibility now, that's really going to help you. Take care of the little things if you want God to give you the big things. Right? Luke 16.10 says, One who's faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who's dishonest in very little is also dishonest with much. And so if you want to have a solid ministry, be faithful with what you have right now. If you want to be a missionary overseas someday, then you know be sharing the gospel here on campus or in your job. Um, it also means you know taking care of your schoolwork, doing well in your job, um, and sharing with your friends. So if you if you want a spouse, it helps to be faithful with your singleness. Um, that doesn't mean that if you are faithful, God is for sure going to give you a spouse. But I'm saying if you want that responsibility, that's a good way to start. And why would we? Um, expect, why would we expect to be faithful with the, a bigger thing? Why would we expect God to give that to us if we have not been faithful with what he's already given to us? Right? Does that make sense? Um, 
Now, this doesn't mean that you like have to get married in order to have a good ministry, right? That's not what I'm saying. Some of the greatest evangelists and, and preachers of all time didn't get married. Like George Whitfield. Never got married. But he was basically responsible for the Great Awakening. So uh, he did pretty well. Yeah. The second thing is get a mentor. It's something you can do now. You can get a mentor. Um, because your spouse will determine the course of your life and ministry, it doesn't help to start getting input now on that subject. Now, I, I didn't really grow up in a home where biblical relationships were modeled for me. And so seeking out mentors on that issue was like almost the only way that I could, that I could figure it out, you know, um, figure out what it looked like in the real world. So um, it's good that some of you can go to mom and dad and do that. But for those of you that can't, um, you know, that's, that's what you got to do. You got to go to biblical mentors. Um, Seek out people who are living a missional lifestyle in the context of marriage and family. Um, get all the wisdom you can now so that you'll be more ready when you get married. Now, there are going to be things that you're just not, you're straight up not going to be ready for, right? But you can start preparing, right? And, you know, sometimes you can only get so ready for a test, right? And there are just things that maybe you're not going to be able to get ready for on that test. And on a bigger scale, that's kind of what family is like. You know, there are going to be some things you're not ready for. But the more you get input from mentors, the more ready you will be. Does that make sense? So the last thing is live missionally now. A good time in life to build in that habit, that lifestyle of, of living missionally. Because if you're not doing it now, what makes you think you'll magically be able to do it after graduation? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Go for it. Um, yeah, what, what makes you think you're going to magically be able to live missionally when you have a spouse or when you have kids? Like, it's not going to just automatically change, right? So you've got to be doing that stuff now, figuring out what's, your, what's my next step if I want to live a missional lifestyle now. Um, you know, just like with spiritual growth, you've got to be more intentional after graduation with that. Um, you know, we kind of build it into the system here in Challenge. We have all these days where we do outreach on campus. We have... These things called power hour, where you can pair up with somebody once a week and go out and share the gospel. Um, but you won't have that, you know, after you graduate. Um, so build that habit now. And, and remember that the thing that undergirds all of this stuff is the gospel. That is our foundation. That's our basis for why we do what we do. Not to earn God's favor, not because it's just something I know that I have to do, but because of what God has already done for us. Um, we, you know, we stood condemned before God. We deserved punishment. We deserved death and hell, and that's it. But God, in his mercy, provided that substitutionary sacrifice for us. And Jesus took our sin upon himself on the cross. Um, and not only that, he gave us his perfect record of righteousness that we didn't deserve. And it was, it was God's love that did that for us. A love for us and a love for his own glory. And so 1 John 3, 1 says... See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And so that's why we live missionally. That's why we want to, to reach people with the gospel. We want San Diego to know. We want the U.S. to know. We want the world to know. Um, John and I were talking the other day, and we were talking about how whenever something good happens to you, you really want to tell somebody, man, I found a $20 bill. Wait, what? Yeah, I found a $20 bill. You know, you just want to share that kind of stuff, right? Well, something awesome has happened to us, more than finding a $20 bill or winning the lottery or whatever. Like, we know God. That's crazy, right? And this isn't just, like, something cool that has happened to us. This is something cool that has happened and is true for anybody who believes. So, like, you can believe, and that it's true, and God saves you, you know? It's not just like, it's like, hey, man, I found a $20 bill, and God's given them out. You know? It's kind of like that. I mean, on a much greater level. <laughs> Not a great analogy. But in any case, um, you know, let's go into the summer and, and live this way. You know, let's, let's be missional wherever God has us for this summer, whether it's East Asia or here in San Diego or back home. Um, or if you're graduating and getting a job in Cleveland for some reason, go do it there, you know, and be cold. 
Um, but yeah, for those of you that are graduating, you know, live your life this way, because that's what that's what you're here for. That's what you're on earth for. And there's nothing greater to live for. This is the greatest thing that you could possibly live for in the universe. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have time to fill out connection cards. Father God, um, I thank you so much for uh, what you've done for us in Christ. The fact that you've gotten challenged through another year of, um, of just ministry and, and fellowship. and uh, I pray that you would help us all to live out our faith and live biblically, share the good news of Jesus with those that, that don't know it yet. Um, I pray that you would continue to draw people to yourself um, and save people. Yeah, would, Holy Spirit, would you just continue to fill our hearts, empower us for your glory, and continue to um, help us to see you for who you truly are, um, which is the greatest, the ultimate thing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you now we're going to have a little time to fill out the connection cards for small groups. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful for you and for growing in your relationship with God. If you are a college student in between the ages of 18 and 26, we want to invite you to join us on campus for our weekly meeting. If you want to see more videos like this about how to grow in your relationship with God, go ahead and click this video icon up here and it'll take you to a link to another video. Also, I want to remind you not to forget to subscribe to the Challenge channel by clicking on the Challenge logo right down here. Thanks, guys.